Satellite communications have been around for a long time. In fact, before it was a reality, Arthur C. Clarke, famed science fiction writer of 2001 A Space Odyssey and Mother Stories, described in an article for a magazine in 1945 a way to deliver communications via satellites positioned specifically around the Earth. Fast forward 22 years to 1957 and Sputnik became the first satellite in space and orbited the Earth for three months, sending a ping back to Earth that even amateur radio owners could hear before falling back into the atmosphere. In 1962, NASA Telstar 1 was launched and became the first transatlantic communication satellite relaying TV signal from Maine to Brittany, France. It transmitted over 500 phone, telegraph, fax, and TV transmissions and proved the concept of satellite communications. Eventually, we went from these low bandwidth satellites to much faster and much higher bandwidth ones. From Starlink to Telesat and Amazon services to Viasat, there are now satellite broadband providers. And even if you don't think you've ever used a satellite for internet access, if you've ever used Wi-Fi on a plane, you have. So how do we get signal from a piece of technology moving up to 17,000 or more miles per hour above the Earth down to us here on the surface? And how is this technology rapidly evolving? And how will we soon start seeing it more integrated into our daily lives? <laughs> Okay, so firstly, we need to talk about the satellite part of that satellite communication. There are three main types of satellites, low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and geostationary orbit satellites. Each of these operate at varying heights above the surface of the Earth, each with their own benefits and challenges. Geostationary satellites are the furthest away at approximately 36,000 kilometers, 22 and a half or so thousand miles above the surface and are actually synced with the orbit of the Earth. So they rotate around the planet at the same speed and direction as the planet's own rotational spin. This means that they are always pointed at the same spot on the planet, making them very predictable. And also because of their height, they have a much larger swath of the surface that they can cover with signal. The downside is that they have a long delay for the signal to get from the surface of the Earth to the satellite and vice versa. MEO, or medium Earth orbit satellites, are the next furthest away at about 8,000 to 20,000 kilometers or 5,000 to 12 and a half or so thousand miles above the surface of the Earth and are typically used for navigation at that higher altitude like the GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS in a semi-synchronous orbit that is predictable and has an orbital period of about 12 hours. Since they're closer to the Earth than the GEO satellites, that means they have about a five times lower latency and can provide higher data rates as well. LEO, or low Earth orbit satellites, are are the closest satellites to the Earth, operating at a height of about 160 to 2,000 kilometers, 100 to 1,200 or so miles above the Earth. This is actually where the majority of the satellites orbiting the Earth are located. Companies like Starlink, OneWeb, and GlobalStar are all at these altitudes. Reason being is that because of their closeness, we have the lowest latency and a lot more capacity. But they also orbit the Earth in about one and a half to two hours or so. So they move very quickly across the sky eight kilometers a second, five miles a second or so, and can only cover a small portion of the Earth with signal as they pass, meaning that a lot more of them are needed in each system called constellations. Regardless of which orbit they are in, satellite communications works in a similar way. You have this satellite, which has a feeder link, it's called, to a gateway or a base station on the planet. Think of this like the backhaul for the satellite connecting it to the internet, let's say. Then the satellite can use its transponders, which are transmitters and responders, to transmit and receive signal from devices, and then transmit and receive signal from the gateway to create a data link with the device, and again, let's say the internet. The next thing we are in the midst of seeing is MSS, or Mobile Satellite Services, aka the integration of using satellites to communicate directly with smartphones. You've probably seen the Apple iPhone 14 launch and the fact that they now have integrated an SOS-specific service into their phones. The idea is that if you're out of signal, the phone can access satellites to send basic text messages to emergency services only, as the bandwidth is very low, to the point where Apple had to compress basic text messages in order to get them to send in any semi-reasonable amount of time. Now, even though that's how a lot of people were interested introduced to satellite services on smartphones, it's actually been in the works for a while now. Back in 2017, the 3GPP, the third generation partnership project which helps create open broadband standards around the world, began proposing satellite integration standards using LEO and GEO satellites in conjunction with 5G in what was called RHEL 15 or Release 15. Fast forward to RHEL 17 in 2020 or so, and a collection of standards for mobile phones communicating with NTNs or non-terrestrial networks, aka satellites, 
was created. It's believed that Apple is actually using some of the standards that are in RHEL 17 for their own situation, but they're adding in their own proprietary stuff because of course, Apple always wants to be able to make more money on whatever they do. Regardless though, those NTNs are being folded into the same sets of standards and protocols that our earthly bound networks like 5G and Wi-Fi use through that 3G PP set of standards. And it's divided into two groups. We have IoT NTN, which is already working with various satellite networks at scale and will be used as an extension of IoT, the Internet of Things systems, for things that don't require the fastest speeds or lowest latencies, but it is particularly energy efficient. And we have NR NTN new radio NTN, which is still being deployed at scale, but will be used for broadband services for devices that need much faster speeds and lower latency. MediaTek, the chipset manufacturer responsible for most Alexa devices, is number one in chipsets for TVs, and even the largest global smartphone chipset manufacturer as well, launched the MT6825 chipset specifically for satellite communications and devices using the RHEL 17 open standards, as they believe using those open standards will cultivate a much better ecosystem than a bunch of competing proprietary Ones. And while the NRNTN devices are in the works, we already have devices that have come out using the MediaTek MT6825 chipset and are utilizing that IoT NTN system right now to enable not only emergency services, but a lot more as well. Devices like this Motorola Defy Satellite Link, which is built in partnership with Bullet and has the MT6825 chipset inside, acts as a satellite link to Bullet's system of satellites. Geo mostly, so there's a lot less aiming the device at things, but Leo ones could work in the future as well. And it uses a Bluetooth connection to allow you to be able to use an app you install on your iPhone or Android device to connect to emergency services using a company called Focus Point International, where your immediate location and basic triage questions can be answered to facilitate help. But also, you can actually send text messages to anyone you want through the app, as well as share your location for a specific amount of time all through satellites whenever you don't have normal terrestrial coverage. But beyond enabling this on older devices by using a Dongle. They also are putting them into new phones like this Cat S75, the first commercially available device with the MT6825 built in and the Bullet app pre-installed. So you can see how this might end up in newer phones going forward to help with filling in the gaps of our normal coverage. The idea is that eventually we'll have NR NTN at scale and 5G is being integrated as well so they can work in tandem with our terrestrial 5G networks. MediaTek actually demonstrated this back in August of 2022 by connecting a smartphone to a 5G NTN emulating LEO satellites in a lab for the first time. So eventually satellite speeds and latency will improve as well. And thanks to the standards and chipsets like the MT6825 in smartphones and other devices helping with the complicated logistics of connecting to a 28,000 kilometer per hour satellite and ones that are up to 36,000 kilometers away, we'll have a seamless connection between our cellular and our Wi-Fi networks, all bolstered by high-speed satellite connectivity in the some 60% of the globe that isn't in internet coverage zones. And there you go, guys. Hope you learned something. But if you want to learn more, there's a link in the description where you can see what else MediaTek is up to with satellite connectivity. I'm now going to try to find my way out of this forest if I can remember the way I came. Plane in the forest. Me to the chopper. Oh, good boy, whatever you. Go away.